Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about calories in food. You know, these nutrition labels are everywhere, and in times past, the way they figured out how many calories a piece of food had were to take a sample of it and load it into a sealed chamber filled with pressurized oxygen and burn the food and see how much heat was released. This is called bomb calorimetry. And in this case, the term bomb is kind of an archaic use of it. Uh, in this case, we really don't want the chamber to blow up, but it's still a sealed vessel with pressure inside, which is why it's called a bomb. Um, my bomb calorimeter actually has a couple of cool features, though. It has glass windows, so we can actually see the thing burning. And I've got some high-speed video and also a high-speed pressure gauge connected to the chamber, so we can have kind of a time-synchronized pressure profile with the video going, which I think is pretty original. Uh, but anyway, I mentioned that it, this only is how they did this uh, technique of measuring calories in food in times past. By now, we've basically characterized every possible ingredient, and so all of the nutrition labels that you find now are basically assembled mathematically. Like, the, the manufacturer knows how much weight of each ingredient they used, and they just add up all the stuff. So we really don't use calorimetry anymore for, um, for food labels, but it is still used in metabolic studies, which we'll get to. As I was making this video, a lot of interesting questions came up. Like, for example, you could load paper and mineral oil into this chamber and burn it, and it would burn very well. But you couldn't survive on paper and mineral oil, and if you tried to, you'd probably wish you weren't alive anymore. But um, the question remains, if you see a calorie label and it says 190 calories, does that mean flammable calories or digestible calories, or, or both, basically? Does it include the whole thing? And then it gets even more interesting. For example, in a recent video, Sally LePage said that 20% of all the calories that a ruminant consumes, like a cow, go into just feeding its gut microbiota. So those 20% of calories aren't even available for the, energy, for, for the animal to survive. So then I started wondering, well, how efficient is the human gut, right? I mean, like, if you ate the calories, there's all these ways that you can lose it. Like, some calories are flammable but not digestible. Some of the calories are consumed by the two or three pounds of bacteria that are living in your body right now. And some of the calories, your body just misses. I mean, no system is 100% efficient. So I, I went on a journey to uh, try to discover how efficient the human gut is. And what I did was I ate nothing but Soylent for an entire week uh, so that I had a very consistent calorie intake. And then I uh, collected the output from this week experiment and we're going to do some calorimetry on the input and the output and try to come up with a bound for how efficient the human gut can be. So um, a lot of interesting things to talk about in this video, so let's get started. Let's talk about the design and build of this pressure chamber. The most difficult thing about this design was finding out what pressure it really needed to contain. Go ahead, try to find out what the maximum pressure in a food type calorimeter like this is on the internet. I couldn't find anything, so we had to estimate. Uh, we know that when we put the food in here, we charge it with oxygen up to maybe about 30 atmospheres. And I think it's likely that we're not going to get above 300 atmospheres. That would mean that the entire thing is filled with flame, and the flame is 10 times higher in terms of absolute temperature. So if we're at 300 Kelvin now, if the entire flame was 3,000 Kelvin, then that would mean the temperature or the pressure is also up 10x, so 300 atmospheres. I think that's a fair upper bound for where this should be. But you never know, so starting off with small samples uh, is a good idea, and of course standing clear is also a good idea. So how did I build this thing? I started with Schedule 160 steel pipe, and this pipe has a working pressure of 6,000 and a burst pressure of 15,000, so way, you know, we're, of course we're drilling holes in the side, so that kind of goes out the window, but this is definitely meant to not be the failure point of the design. I knew I wanted to have clear windows, nice big clear windows on the front and the back so that we could look all the way through it. And I settled on this idea of uh, using the lathe to cut a ledge on the inside of the pipe and then putting an o-ring on that ledge and then putting a window on the o-ring like this. And then the top part also has a nice smooth turned ledge on there that will come down this way and press down on the window. And you can actually just tighten it by hand. It doesn't even require tools to uh, make a good seal. Initially, I thought I would want to use solid, thick glass windows. And I found this is actually a solid chunk of glass that I got from McMaster. And it's not quite thick enough. 
Um, designing pressure windows in glass is kind of an iffy business already because glass fails one, suddenly it cracks and flies apart, which is not so good. But two, it also doesn't really have a strength of material like a ductile material would. Glass is a brittle material and it fails statistically. So you have to um, uh, settle on a probability, like a one in a million chance that if you take it up to this pressure, it's gonna break. And none of this is sounding that great. So I actually decided instead to use a composite window. So I have a relatively thin piece of glass uh, facing the burn side. Of course, you can't have plastic facing anything inside the chamber because there's going to be pressure and, and pressurized oxygen and super high temperature flames in there. So absolutely nothing flammable can face the chamber side. And as we'll see, this ended up coming back to bite me with these O-rings. But anyway, so it's glass faced to get good uh, flame resistance. And then I backed it up with some acrylic sheets that I laminated together, cut on the laser, and then turned on the lathe. And I did a little bit of a sloppy job kind of laminating them here, but it gets the idea across. So I like this, and this is actually a similar construction to what I used for the high-pressure supercritical CO2 chamber that I built. I really like this idea of using a relatively thin piece of glass for chemical resistance and backing it up with a ton of plastic. So if we put the O-ring in, and then put this in with the glass window down. Another benefit is that it's the plastic surface that is up here. So when we screw this steel cap down, it's gonna put a fair bit of force around the edge here. And if this edge were glass, if there were like a tiny little you know, particle of sand or something in there, when you crank down on this, there's a very good chance you could cause a, st a stress concentration and crack the glass. So it's nice to be able to work with a plastic window on this side. Another benefit is that if this does fail, probably what's going to happen is the glass will crack first and allow the vessel to leak, uh, hopefully leak fast enough so that the pressure goes down before the plastic windows fail. So it has kind of an inherent leak before burst property to it. I mentioned that these O-rings came back to bite me. Yeah, as it turns out, I, I started off using just Buna N, you know, nitrile O-rings, and these burn in pure oxygen, of course, like, like a lot of things do. And uh, I had a trouble with, with these actually lighting on fire and not extinguishing. So then uh, it was late one night and I didn't want to wait around to buy silicone O-rings. So if you ever need to make really fine, uh, very detailed thin silicone parts that are around, what you can do is double stick tape a piece of flat silicone rubber to a piece on a lathe and then use an X-Acto blade in the tool holder and just slice out a really thin, really high quality seal. So putting this in, and then the glass, and then the top, and that's it, we're ready to go. The pressure fill port is a bicycle gate, a very Schrader valve, and this worked kind of okay. Uh, one challenge is that we're filling this to about 30 atmospheres of oxygen, so the amount of force that it takes to push the Schrader valve open is pretty high. You have to, it, it takes, it's about as high as you really want to go by hand. It just takes too much force to force the valve open. And I'm of course, you know, way overdoing it. I, I just, you know, I just got a cheap Schrader valve thing and this thing is way over its rated pressure, but these are all metal pieces and you know, 30 atmospheres isn't too crazy there. The copper tube is fine. This is rated to take a lot of pressure. And um, I also tried uh, like a higher quality Schrader valve and I, I was having trouble finding ones that had a valve on both sides and I found some that you needed an on off valve. But anyway, this is the easiest, quickest way for sure. The pressure gauge actually came from DigiKey and this one is neat because it has a, um, an analog output that's very high frequency. It claims like a one millisecond response time, which is neat. And this thing goes all the way up to 10,000 PSI, so we're not going to have any troubles uh, with the pressure gauge. And then finally, the electrical pass-throughs. So we need a way to ignite what's inside there, and we do this by using a thin piece of nichrome ignition wire. And we need to get you know, a handful of amps through the outside here. And uh, there aren't really any commercial off-the-shelf pass-throughs that would work super well in this case. What I need is to have a pretty stout screw terminal inside there. I can't really use, there's not enough room for alligator clips or terminal blocks or anything like that. So what I came up with is uh, use a piece of uh, steel welding rod and braze on the little terminal block, 
little screw terminal at the end there. It's just a piece of threaded standoff. And then also braze on a collar and then put this whole thing together into a barbed tube fitting using an insulator. So there's uh, a piece of plastic as a um, centering and an insulating element between the, the um, a welding rod and the, and the pipe fitting. And then I filled it up with my favorite Hysol 1C epoxy and the little uh, collar that I brazed on there provided like a positive lock. So if there's a huge amount of pressure applied to this side, the force will go through that collar, through the epoxy, and into the body of the thing. And it can't fail catastrophically unless it rips the metal apart. So even if the epoxy fails, the, little, uh, the metal piece won't come flying out of here unless it's able to rip that brazed collar off, which I don't think it's going to. All right, so let's burn something here. I'm going to use uh, this 32 gauge nichrome wire as the ignition wire. And what we're going to do is cut a little bit off and I'm going to form a loop like this and put it down into the chamber so that the loop is low because I'm going to put the piece of food we're going to burn on the bottom here. So I'm just going to go in there and screw this, uh, use the screw terminals to attach this little piece of nichrome. Next, what we need to do is attach something that's flammable directly to the ignition wire, like this pure cotton uh, string. And this is actually a huge amount, so I'm actually just gonna take one of the little strands from this string. And the idea here is that we need a, um, a slightly bigger match to get our piece of food going. If the thing that we're burning is not super flammable by itself, uh, then we need something that's already got a pretty good flame going from that ignition wire. So what will happen is we'll tie this piece of cotton string to the ignition wire and then put the piece of food near that and then the flame from the cotton will get the piece of food going. As it happens, my oxygen cylinder in my oxyacetylene welding set is a little low right now. In fact, it's pretty much perfect right at about 30 atmospheres. So I took the regulator off entirely and just connected that copper tube right to the output because it's pretty much the pressure that we need. Okay, so we're going to burn a goldfish cracker, which weighs about half a gram, which is, I think, a, a good weight for this size chamber. And I'm going to put this guy here near the front so we can get a good look at it. Okay, we got the Kronos on, we got the chamber sealed. Uh, it's time to add some oxygen. And let's see if we can get this without disturbing the whole thing. As you can see on the oscilloscope here, we've got some pressure in there and you can read it off here. It's at about 480 PSI. So there's our 30 something atmospheres or 30 atmospheres about. And uh, let's see, we're almost ready for ignition. I was having a ton of problems with the force of the oxygen blowing into the chamber, uh, blowing the little cracker around in there. So what I ended up doing is just using a, a tiny bit of UV cure adhesive and I just glued the cracker to that steel cup there so that it'll hold it in place. Let's try that. Okay, Kronos running, face shield down, ignition on. So it looks like there might be some O-ring carnage here. So let's uh, take a look at what we've got. Try to vent this slowly. By the way, the chamber is warm. It's, it's not hot or anything, but it's definitely warmer than it is out in the garage today, which is pretty cold. Yeah. So let's take a look at that. You can see my idea of using a 
a silicone o-ring because it wouldn't burn uh, didn't work out quite perfectly um, everything burns in pure oxygen well a lot of things burn in pure oxygen and what's interesting here is that um, the part that was exposed to the flame burned but the part that was pinched tightly between the glass and the metal uh, was able to stay okay i mean the, the, the thing still kept a seal and everything um, it was able to sink heat away fast enough where it couldn't catch fire but I guess there was a part of the O-ring that was exposed enough to the flame front where it did catch fire and left quite a bit of um, quite a bit of ash and everything in here. So this will, of course, affect our readings. Uh, by the way, the, the the cracker appears to be completely gone. There's, eh, you know, a little bit of ash and stuff in there. A lot of it's from the O-ring, but that that goldfish cracker is is gone. So we also verified that the peak pressure only got up to about 1600 PSI in that experiment and it took a whole three or four seconds to get up there. So when I first started this I thought, you know, bomb calorimeter, maybe it goes bang or something. But no, it actually burns relatively slowly. I mean, if you have a solid piece of food in there, it, it does take a while for the flame front to move through that solid piece of material. So yeah, it burns quickly, but, but not instantly. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend maybe like atomizing gasoline or anything inside there. That sounds like it might um, burn a little too fast in pressurized pure oxygen. So this whole setup is really meant for doing food samples, things that burn but are not super, super highly flammable. I wouldn't put any sort of liquid uh, fuel in there. Okay, so let's take some measurements with this thing. Let's find out, really, answer that age-old question, how many calories are in a turd? Uh, so what I'm going to do is remove the pressure gauge and put a plug in here so that I can dip it into that tank of water and then we'll be able to measure the temperature change that results from the heat that's released from what we're burning in here. And I'm going to have to orient it vertically, so I'm kind of worried about the o-ring again uh, being in the more of the path of the flames, and so I, I'll see if I can maybe come up with like a Teflon seal or something in this configuration. In order to make a numerical measurement with this setup, we need to know how much the temperature is going to change for a given heat input. So if we burn something inside this calorimeter, there has to be some way to translate the temperature change that we're going to measure into a heat output. So we could do this just by trying to add up all the different materials. We could say, well, we've got, you know, a kilo of water, we've got a half a kilo of steel, there's, you know, a few grams for the thermometer itself, there's another 20 or 30 grams for the stir, but that is extremely unreliable and difficult to do. So a better way to calibrate this system is to just use a known quantity of fuel, and benzoic acid is always the one they use for reasons that I'll tell you in a second, and put a certain, a, you know, a carefully measured quantity of that in there, burn that, and then just check what the temperature changes and say, okay, well, it's a black box. We don't know what all the materials are, but we do know that it changes this much temperature when we burn this much known fuel. And the reason benzoic acid is always picked is because it's a solid at room temperature. It can be easily crystallized. It burns slow, but not too slow. Um, it's non-toxic. It's easy to get. It's cheap. You really could use a lot of different things, but um, this just has physical properties that make it you know, a nice choice. Okay, so we've got our uh, benzoic acid measured out into this metal crucible here, and I added a little mesh tray inside there so we can put use this thing vertically. I've got the pressure gauge removed and replaced with a plug, and so what I'm going to do is put that crucible down in there and then drape the uh, ignition wire and the cotton wire down into the crucible. And I decided to just go with the same silicone seal. It's still going to be just fine for the top here. Um, well, it might burn up actually, but we <laughs> we'll try something. But I did chicken out on the window. Instead of having the glass up here, I was worried that the flames are going to roll up and hit right on the glass there. So instead I turned an aluminum window and this will go in here and screw this on top. And the fact that we're changing materials doesn't matter yet because we haven't calibrated anything. So this will be the first run with calibration. Okay, some of you are probably realizing, uh, yeah, it doesn't work to just have full pressure behind this straighter valve because what ends up happening is it just blows the thing completely to, you know, disarray in there and so now all the powder is in the bottom. So I'm going to clean all this out and then I will uh, shut off the oxygen at the tank, connect the valve up and open the valve slowly to try to, um, you know, <laughs> not disturb the powder in there. Okay, back in a sec. Okay, so we're ready to put all this together here. We've got our 
sealed chamber full of pressurized oxygen and the half gram about of benzoic acid. And what I'm gonna do is put it inside this tall uh, paint can inside the styrofoam. And inside here, we've got a platinum 100, very sensitive thermometer. Well, the thermometer itself is not sensitive, but the thing that's reading it certainly is. You ever seen that many digits behind a uh, temperature reading? Very, very accurate and very, very sensitive to change. And so just putting my hand in there, there's just air in there right now, will actually cause the graph to change a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is put this inside and then tip the camera over so you can see the setup. Looking down into that paint can, you can see we've got our calorimeter set up there and the stirrer going. We're gonna add some water to it. And the amount of water, again, is not critical as long as it's controlled and not changed between the calibration run and the actual sample run. So let's pour in enough water to cover that thing up. Okay, so now we can run the whole experiment from here. When the temperature has stabilized to whatever degree of satisfaction that we want, that the temperature is in fact stable, we'll hit the ignition there and then uh, we'll see the temperature change. And again, we can wait until we decide it's stable. And there's also some other interesting mathematical ways of determining what the total change is based on you know, the slope and the change and all this stuff. But let's uh, wait for this to stabilize and then we'll collect a run. I just cleared the buffer here and the graph auto scales. And so it looks like the thing is still changing a lot, but we're talking about, you know, thousands of a degree C. So let's just go for it. I'm gonna wait, face shield on. Okay, let's hit the ignition. Of course, you don't really hear anything because uh, we noticed it didn't even make that much noise even in the, um, even with the glass windows on. But here we got a big temperature change going on now. Okay, so the O-ring looks good. Uh, it's still there, I mean, it's, that's a good sign. And the benzoic acid is gone and there's this red kind of um, exhaust material there, but otherwise I think that's a good burn. So uh, I think that was a good calibration. Okay, so now I'm gonna measure out about half a gram of the Soylent into our little metal crucible. And again, the exact amount doesn't matter uh, as long as it's you know kind of close to half a gram, just so we know we're not gonna burn too much or too little fuel. But as long as you record the number, the exact amount is not that important. But I do have to get it in the crucible and not onto the platter of the scale there. Okay, here goes Soylent, wait, face shield. Okay, Soylent. So now we come to the finale. Input on the left, output on the right. This is kind of life in a nutshell here, is turning brown powder into other brown powder, you know, dust to dust. But anyway, the scientific name for what's on the right would be lyophilized fecal matter, but I'm just gonna say, yeah, it's a freeze-dried ground up turd. And I made that in my freeze dryer, uh, it took about 10 hours, and the process is basically making astronaut ice cream. It's, it's exactly the same. And when we're done, uh, by the way, this thing has almost no smell. It, it doesn't smell like anything. And that's because all the volatiles, including the water and everything else that was in there, ended up in the trap in the freeze dryer. And uh, believe you me, if anything should be called, you know, Ugh, de toilette, it's, it's this stuff, because believe, this is like concentrated, distilled essence of poop. Um, so the smell is gone along with the water. And that's uh, actually interesting for our experiments too, because some of those volatiles might have been slightly flammable, like 
would, would contribute calories. But again, this is not a publication quality thing. We're just kind of screwing around here. So let's uh, weigh out about a half a gram of that powder and uh, see, how much, see how much fuel is in there. Okay, bombs away. This is interesting. Uh, after that last sample, there's quite a bit of residue in there, and I haven't seen that with anything else we've burned. Um, that could be minerals or something that are more concentrated in that uh, last sample. Don't know, but that's uh, an unusual observation. So I've crunched the numbers and have some surprising results. Uh, but first, uh, if you haven't heard of Soylent, what is this stuff? It's basically just Ensure, you know, that milkshake for retired folks, but it's in dry powder form and it's marketed towards younger people and it has this ridiculous name. It's not Soylent Green, it's Soylent Brown. But, um, you know, I, I like this stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. The only reason I chose this for my experiment is because it's dry and it's very consistent. Like, I can eat this all day, every day, and kind of know exactly I'm getting the same macronutrient breakdown. So for the, for the test here, I just needed to know that I wasn't going to have something inconsistent going on. So after eating this for a week, I would be sure that my output was, you know, aligned to whatever the input was. But as we'll see, there's, this gets a lot more complicated. By the way, I would recommend trying this crazy diet if you just want something interesting to do. Eating this, only this, for a week. I had black coffee, water, and soylent, and that was it for seven days. And it was quite, a, um, a quite an interesting experience. I, like I say, I would recommend it. Um, at the end of the week, food tastes so good that it's worth it just to introduce a little bit more dynamics into your life. It's just, it's just kind of an interesting thing to do. Uh, but anyway, let's take a look at the numbers, because this is actually pretty interesting as well. So first, the calibration. I, I did another run where I burned just the cotton thread in the ignition wire, and the temperature of the water bath changed by a very small amount, 0 0.0176 degrees. So I'll subtract this from all the other ones later on, and uh, you know that's how I'm going to get rid of the cotton in the ignition wire, and assume it was the same throughout. Okay, so then we did the run with the benzoic acid in there, about a half gram of benzoic acid. And we're using this value from the internet, 26,000 uh, joules per gram, as the heat of combustion for benzoic acid. So this is what we're using to calibrate the entire system. And, uh, you know, we run through the numbers and multiply it by the weight, and uh, we get this calorimeter constant of 16,642 joules per degree. So if the water bath changes by one degree C, then we know that 16,642 joules have been released. Easy enough. As long as we don't change anything, same amount of water, same amount of steel and the thermometer and everything else are the same, then this constant will stay correct. Okay, so then we did the Soylent and uh, found something interesting. If we go through the numbers, uh, we, we know how much heat was released because we know the temperature change and we know the constant, and then we divide by the amount of mass of Soylent that we put in there. We get a value of 20,368 joules per gram for the Soylent. Now, if we go to the label, a serving is uh, 60 grams and has 270 calories. But remember, a dietary calorie is actually 1,000 calorie calories. So 270,000 divided by 60 and then multiply by 4.184 to get joules would give us 18,828 joules per gram. So it's a little bit off, but something very interesting happens here. If we subtract out the dietary fiber from the... Um, from the mass, then it starts working out almost exactly correct. So I can't tell, I can't tell, it says dietary fiber and soluble fiber, and it's kind of under the ledger. So I don't know if the four includes the two or if they're in addition. So I tried it both ways. And if we include both of them, then the, the real mass is only 54 grams. And if we divide this all out, we get a number of 20,920, which is pretty darn close to our measured value. And if we, you know, assume the, the fibers the other way around, we end up with 20,173. So now we're getting really close to our measured value. So this is great. I mean, it's always nice when you, you know, come up with a crazy setup like this and it's actually coming in within, you know, what, 5, 10% or something. That's, that's pretty nice. So I think the system is working. And the, food and the food label seems accurate. So now here's the surprising bit. There's a lot of calories in fecal matter, right? So I, this, the, uh, the fecal matter actually ended up with 16,000 joules per gram. 
And remember, the Soylent was only 20,000. So is that possible? The output actually has like, what, 75% or more of the calories per gram than the, so than the input does. So this is a surprise, and I'm glad it was so far off, because if I did all this and it ended up feeling like there was 20% remaining, then I'd say, okay, well, maybe the human body is 80% efficient, right? You, you eat the calories and 20% of them come out because your body wasn't able to utilize them. But the fact that we're so far off here is good because now we can tell that we're missing a piece of information. So clearly what's happening here is there's flammable calories in the fecal matter, but they aren't usable for dietary purposes anymore, at least not by a normal mammal digestive system. Um, it's composed of the fiber. So we just realized that this stuff doesn't count towards the calorie budget. This is already interesting. So that when you see the number of calories on a label like this, it does not include the flammable calories that are in the dietary fiber. I mean, that makes sense, but that's, that's a kind of an interesting thing to note. And if you're using a, a, a oxygen bomb calorimeter like we're doing, then you have to take that into account because if you burn it, you burn everything. And that doesn't represent what you would get dietarily from it, you know. So, uh, you know, this is kind of un uncovering more questions than answers, which is okay. And then I think a really good follow-up is going to be how to get these macronutrient breakdowns out of it. So how do we actually know how much fat, uh, protein, and carbohydrates are in a sample? Because then we could go through this all again with all the samples and try to figure out what really happened. And it's really the macronutrients that we care about. So I think that's what's going to be for next time or, or the time after or something. But I find all this dietary science stuff pretty interesting because there's such a lack of it on the internet. If you want to look for dietary science, you know where you go is these livestock uh, information sources. Farmers have been very, very carefully characterizing exactly how many calories to feed their livestock to maximize you know, their profits, basically. So that's been studied to the nth degree. But in humans, it's just not studied as well partially because maybe it's hard to convince people to eat soy every day, all day for a week or something. But I, I don't know. It does seem like there's a lot to be learned here. And if we did come up with an actual efficiency number for the human gut, maybe that explains why some people can eat a lot more calories than others. And it seems like they don't, you know, gain as much weight from it or something. But a lot of interesting stuff to, to look at in here. So I'm looking forward to coming back to this topic sometime soon. All right. Well, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.